freight forwarding in 10 years' time will not be freight forwarding what it is today. Mm. It will be a lot of automation. Yeah. It will be, you know, I mean, AI, analytics, big mm-hmm. data, blockchain. That is going to be the future of our industry. So a lot of the current tasks that we have in terms of employing, when we employ an operations person or a cartage person, or they'll be non-existent anymore. Mm. Right, you got all. So you have automated trucks. You got autom- They're going to do automated ships. They got mm. uh, the automated terminals already yeah. operating out of China and even Barcelona. The whole terminal is all yeah. automated. Yeah. Soon everything is going to be systems talking to systems. Mm. So the industry as a freight forwarder, mm. which is traditionally right now, even you look at it, my company right now, we are pushing forward with tech. But right now, if you look at it today, in this moment, we are still essentially glorified data entry people here. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right? Mm. That's what they're doing. So we're trying to automate all that out. Mm. Um, so in time, what we're going to have, folks here would need to pivot into essentially become system resellers. Mm. Not system resellers in some way, but, but more so as guiding the users, our, the, you know, our customers on how to leverage our system or how to use the system. Mm. And then to be essentially the full control tower, looking at the system and do exception management. Mm-hmm. But even then, given enough time, AI will take over that. Yeah. You know? So it is a bleak picture, but that side of conversation, that's going to happen to any industry, not, sure. not, not just unique to our industry. Yeah. For us, you know, it has to be tech. Mm. And over and above developing tech, it has to be slowly, slowly getting the mentality of our people to switch from what they're doing into the tech world. And that it means simply including them in any of the tech development conversations mm. so that the people at the front line understands. Mm. Because you can't go and you, know, you keep on doing what you're doing, let us develop a system, and then somehow at the end of it, we're gonna come together and everybody's gonna get it. Mm. Good luck, it's not gonna happen. Mm. So what we have here is we have a collaborative experience between our folks on the front lines and our tech folks and the leadership. Mm. then we all come together and make sure it's a collaborative experience so that we actually understand what the hell we're creating Mm. and making sure it's always in touch with what we are creating for our customers and Mm. how we save our time in the back office on the back end. So I've got a question for you. That's, I suppose, what the picture you painted there creates, I suppose, threats and opportunities. Yes. Um, Just say we do get to the stage where, you know, you can get the AI and you can get a whole lot of automation and all the rest of it. Do you see the role of a freight forwarder into the future or do you see or because the one thing you don't have is the ships or the aircraft. Um, now, the shipping lines and the airlines can buy all that mm. technology mm, that mm, you've said. Mm. Where, do, where do you see the freight forwarder okay. role? Oh, you're asking great questions, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the thing is, you see, it is my personal opinion Mm. from the years I've been as a freight forwarder, the truest essence of a freight forwarder, Mm. according to La Chang's dictionary, (laughs) is one who knows how to leverage assets, Mm. be it your own or external. Mm -hmm. The shipping lines got the ships. Mm. They've tried to dabble in freight forwarding. They've failed miserably over the years, Mm. you know, they tried to offer the trucking service mm. um, um, uh, in, I mean, in Australia a few times now mm. where they want to include the trucking yeah. end. But they don't capture the fact that there is D high. They don't capture that there is something's going to go wrong, mm. right? They just think it's just going to happen smoothly. That's in the utopian world, which is mm. unrealistic. Mm. So the freight forwarder's value has always been who is best right now mm. in any part of what we do. Mm. And then we leverage on that. Mm. That is the legwork of the freight forward. And that is what I feel is the essence of a freight forwarder. Mm. You shouldn't need to have one warehouse or two warehouses or 10 warehouses. Someone always said to me, I recall many years, you know, because I've always believed a non-asset model in terms of when it comes to freight forwarding or logistics, mm. right? I mean, you know, my background is C.H. Robinson. They're the largest non-asset based freight forwarder yeah. in the world. Mm. And that is like, you know, what some guy will say to me, they go, oh, but you, don't, you, but you guys don't have your own warehouse. You guys mm. don't have your own truck. Mm. And I say, okay, well, if I've got 10 trucks, what type of forwarder does that make me? Mm. Compared yeah. to the guy with the one truck and a mm. hundred truck, mm. how long is a piece of string? Where mm. do we draw the line? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. th- there's enough supply out there yeah. when it comes to these fixed assets. Mm. So the freight forwarder role right now 
has always been leveraging the best out there because our mm. customer relies on us for the best out there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can go direct to the shipping lines. Yeah. They can go direct to the truckers, mm. right? So why we exist continues to be the freight forwarder needs to know within the industry who is the best relevant to the customer you're serving. Mm -hmm. That is today. Tomorrow is a lot more interesting um, 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 outlook. It's like the work that we're currently doing will no longer exist. Yeah. If you look at the true essence of logistics from a military sense, it's about going to places without an established point or distribution channel. Mm -hmm. You literally got to recreate that distribution channel to make sure it's the most efficient so you can get the supply to the frontline mm -hmm. troops. Mm -hmm. Modern day logistics guy, you can have a lot of you know, guys come and go, I'm a, log a, a logistics professional. Mm. Well, yes, yes, you are right in the current sense, but all the ports you're dealing out of, it's already established. Mm. Like for say Shanghai, Sydney, mm. it's still gonna be Shanghai, Sydney. Mm. You've know all the shipping lines, there's five shipping lines. Mm. What, what value are you bringing to the picture? Mm. So compared to the old world logistics to logistics now, it's, mm. it's, everything's discovered. There's mm. no more value for mm. that logistics professional anymore because mm. anybody can go and do that. Mm. So, of course, there are subtle nuances now with this COVID um, 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 disruptions. So mm. you've got to know, keep your ears on the ground, okay, how are you going to get that space from there and yeah. you know, how to get that extra dollar saving there. Mm. But that we're really talking peanuts here. Mm. It doesn't. It strips away at the core of what it is to be a logistics professional. Mm. So that has to shift, and what that will shift means that it will come with tech. Mm. It will come with tech. Ultimately, we need to really become objective about what it is that we're trying to achieve here as a freight forwarder. Mm. Yes, we're moving stuff from A to B, but ultimately, we want our customer to succeed in their competitive environment, mm. so they can be, so they can grow. Yeah. If they grow, you grow. So we need to now start pulling our heads away from what we do that's already established, right? Mm. Booking a container from Shanghai to Sydney is, mm. it, I mean, is exactly that. Yeah. We need to start pulling our heads into our customer's area now mm. and really go into a consultative approach and say, hey, this is your product, these are your lanes. Do you have visibility to how your product is selling? Mm. And, we, and we're really focusing on the SMEs now. Mm. And I can assure you, most of the SMEs probably don't. A lot mm. of them are still working on Excel spreadsheets, yeah. you know, mishmash of different systems, mm. trying to somehow give themselves the best chance of selling that mug or whatever it is mm. that they're selling. Mm. As a freight forwarder, we need to change our mode of selling into their world and say, okay, we know we've got the shipping side covered. Mm. How can we now give you the tools mm. so that you can operate better as a business to grow? Mm. So yes, there is some bleeding into as a freight forwarder and there's a huge shifting and molding to mm. what we are now. The days of a freight forwarder simply moving a shipment from A to B is fast running out mm. because it's gonna be automated out, right? Mm. We need to now become more entrenched with our customers mm. to help them sell better with our logistics experience. Yes, which shipping line to use and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, that is where I generally see the direction heading and this is what we are planning ourselves to be. Mm. Um, and, and, and I can talk about this on yeah. and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, but it's interesting. So, but you, you, even, and again, I'm probably interviewing you, you more than me, but I'm very interested in, in all of this. So the talk about the future and the tech, and I, I'm even impressed that, you know, we've got the, this set up here today <laughs> and, and the whole social media, which has just blown me away. I'm a bit jealous, actually. I would like to have this as a part of FDA. But where do you go with the tech? Is that something that you plan to develop in-house or do you, again, source we, that yeah. from third parties or a bit of a mix? We develop all our tech in-house. Right. We do not believe in outsourcing mm -hmm. purely because... Not that there isn't great product on the marketplace, mm. like you saw in your recent webinar. There's some great mm. people doing some great things out mm. there. And if you're really clever, mm -hmm. you can leverage these things very well and you're mm. gonna make a huge difference to your mm. customer. Mm. Okay, and putting the customer really at the, you know, at, so as the holy grail here. Mm. Um, but we feel that if you really wanna push a vision forward where things are plain to see, Relying on third parties will, will satisfy now, mm. but it will not future-proof if your vision and direction is clear enough and you know exactly where you want to go. Mm. 
we've got we get people from external developers come onto us all the time. Outsource to here, outsource to Ukraine, mm. outsource to mm. India, outsource to Philippines. We've always said no mm. because these folks, you know, are tech company trying to build for industry, mm. and that has never really gelled too well, mm. right? We are now an industry company trying to build tech for the industry. Mm-hmm. And, and this is the subtle nuance that we like to see and we will persist. And it's hard yakka mm. because with borders being shut, talent isn't available. No. You've got big guys like Wise Tech of the World sucking mm. up all the talent. Well, not mm. even then. Look at the YouTube, Facebook. Mm-hmm. If you're a coder, mm. it's just code. Whether yeah. you're code for this guy, same thing. Yeah. And most of them want to go towards the fancier brands. Mm. And it's been hard yakka to find people to develop for an industry, mm. like you said, no one knows about yeah. I read an article the other day, you know, even the Facebook, YouTube and the Googles of the world, they are losing their top talent in tech developing mm. to all the cryptocurrency projects. Mm. And it makes total sense. Now, if you're a coding nerd, mm. you're like, geez, crypto, mm. this is the frontier. Mm. You will naturally mm. go towards there. Mm. So all of these people, they will even shun Google to mm. go to crypto. Mm. God, what do we have a chance in logistics? Mm. <laughs> so it is hard yakka, but... Again, if you're, I like to think our vision is very, very clear. Mm. That's why we persisted. It's mm. a bit slow moving, but what else are we going to do? Mm. You know, this is, you know, the, my favorite thing to do. Mm. You know, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so so yes, so we are a bit slow moving, but it's happening. Everything mm. is done in house, mm. um, and um, and like I said. I still feel that there's a huge opportunity in the industry. Um, and and it has to start from the grassroots and, mm. you know, through your advocacy, through, you know, going into high schools and mm. telling these kids, mm. just educate them a bit more about mm. it. Mm. You know, that's going to make the industry sustain itself a bit longer mm. before everything takes off. If we get more smarter talent coming in here, mm. they can probably fend and defend the industry better yeah. against the inevitable whitewash of tech. Yeah. You know, they could come up with different ingenious ways of how we can pivot and shift. Because mm. you're still talking to someone who's been, you know, in, mm. in this game for a long time. So I've got sort of blinkers on yeah. and I don't have that, yeah. you know, external vision that these young folks can bring to the yeah. game. Yeah. So it's chicken or the egg. Mm. It's chicken or the egg. Mm. <laughs> Look, let's face it. The industry <laughs> hasn't changed that much in my time. Yes. So if I think back to the early 1980s, the only difference is things were a bit more manual, yes. but we still had manifests, we yes. still had airway bills, we yes. still had, and we still reported to customs and and it hasn't changed. Yeah. The only thing that's changed is it's done electronically now. Um, maybe, maybe as you said, maybe the tex- next 10 years is when we really see change, yeah. not just doing the same thing the same way, but on, on going from paper-based systems to electronic systems yes. to a bit smarter electronic yes. systems. Maybe the next 10 years is where we don't just redo but we re-engineer. That's right. That's um, right. So it'll be fascinating. And it'll be fascinating, I think, to see who who survives that change and who prospers in yeah. that change. And, um, and look, it's something I look at even with our own Freight and Trade Alliance. We've got now about 360 freight forwarders as yeah. members of FTA. Yeah. How many? How many will be there in in ten years' time? You know, will I? Will some? Well, that disappear? depends. How many will continue to join you? Well, because they will keep it robust, so you can advocate more, so they can remain sustainable and survive. Well, let's hope, <laughs> let's hope so. We can create the platform, but it needs again, like entities like yourselves and others yeah. who who can, you know, grasp the challenges, but have the foresight and. And deal with the enormous challenges that are no no doubt going to hit. Yeah. But um, yeah, um, just grow with that yeah. and and provide that difference. Yeah. Well, I think you know how many will will survive, with depending on how many of them are truly in it for the essence of logistics, yeah. or are just in it because once we're a salesperson. Yeah. Have a, a book of customers he's drawing his income from, yeah. and he's happy yeah. with that. Um, versus the diehard logistics, like we you know we we want to change the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that ultimately will be the separating point. Um, you know, and and I've spoken to a few folks in my time about you know exactly wanting to advocate more mm. for the industry. Mm. 
and um, and each and every time, most if not all of them have always said, yes, when we first started we had the same vision but then yeah. I got married and had kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's your success. Uh, yeah, that's true. You're, that's still, true. you're, still, <laughs> looking, you're still looking for that perfect woman to come into your life. <laughs> that's true. My, well, my... My woman is, you know, um, this industry, and um, and uh, and I'm perfectly happy and perfectly fine, mm. um, because you know, like I, I mean, for for you know, okay, this is going to be true confession now. Mm. <laughs> um, for probably 15 years of my career, I would dare say. I was a salesperson from dot one mm. and, and and I sold large and small and controlled a significant amount of business. For 15 of those years, I didn't have a clue how anything worked. Mm-hmm. Mm. Not a single clue. Mm. My entire sales pitch wasn't based on any training, mm. it was literally Frankenstein of a sales pitch from this company to that company mm. and trying to mesh it mm. together. Mm. And I would dare say there's a lot of my sales, ex-sales colleagues mm. that are exactly the same. Mm. And when you have that environment, mm. let's call us cowboys, yeah. selling to the market, it takes away from the experience of mm. being a professional yeah. because people won't view you as a professional anymore. Mm. Mm. So it's the latter part of my career in this industry, which mm. then I thought to myself, well, you know, we've got to stop the bullshit. Mm. The bullshit needs to stop. Mm. Let's just actually take a bit of time and study, mm. read, understand, so that you can, you know, if you can't beat it, join them type of, you know, thing. Yeah. So I'm a reluctant, passionate logistics person, mm. um, but I'm happy I am in it now. Mm. And, but I don't want anyone to go through my experience, mm-hmm. you know, because it is yeah. for a good part of it demoralizing, yeah. you know, where, where you felt you've contributed nothing mm. to the world. Mm. Other than BS, yeah. <laughs> so there's my confession for the for for this show. Oh, well, we've, got, we've, got, we've got a title for the episode: "Stopping the BS." 